Everybody. It's so nice to welcome you into the house of the Lord today, to gather together and to praise our God and King. It's nice to be back with you. I've had um, quite a few weeks away for holidays and study at college, but it's really nice to be back with you more full time. But today, as we come into this time of worship, I want to encourage you to listen to that calling of God on your life that he wants us to lead a life worthy of the calling he has spoken over each of us. And we know that we cannot do this alone and we dare not try to do it alone. So we gather together as the people of God's kingdom to lead a life worthy of his calling, a life served with meekness and gentleness. And we come together to build up Christ's body in humility and with patience and love to lead a life which reflects Christ's calling, a life of peace grounded in the spirit. So we would join in our oneness in Christ and we would share in that grace offered to us, a life worth of the calling to which we have been called. We gather as God's family and we invite the Holy Spirit into this place to move amongst us. Won't you please stand with me and sing our first song that the band have introduced to us?
chose in us as your people. Amen. Thank you that you gather us together to be in your presence and experience the moving of your spirit. Lord, I pray that as we go through this time of worship and reflection, that we are open to your word. Open our eyes to see what you have to show us. Open our ears to hear your word and open our hearts to be moved by your calling. May we unite as your people to, as you move us in your direction, living lives worthy of your calling. In your holy name I pray, amen. Well, I don't know what sort of week you've had, but it's been a bit wild for the weather in this last week or two, hasn't it? And I guess just right now, I want to stop and think about this week being National Homelessness Week. And today, the 1st of August, is the beginning of National Homelessness Week and it runs for the week. But as much as we might sit in our houses and think about, wow, listen to how cold it is out there, there's thousands of people across Australia today that that's their lounge room, that's their bedroom, that's their kitchen, that's their bathroom. It's all of those sort of things and that's the places that as much as we might sort of think, darn it, the power's gone out or, geez, it's noisy outside or I'm going to get wet getting to the car, there's people that are actually living in that space every day of their life. And it's not only about the living stuff, it's about the socialisation stuff. And for a lot of the things that happen for those people, people that are experiencing homelessness have all sorts of other issues they have to deal with as well. But inevitably, because of their circumstances, they're not able to deal with those circumstances and it's really important. I guess right at the very start of Homelessness Week, if there's one message I wanted to get through to you today, and it's one that I really want to start off with, is very clearly that in our community we don't have homeless people. We don't have homeless people and it's really important we grasp this as a concept. We have people that are experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness, but we don't have homeless people. And it's really important in everything we think about when we talk about disadvantage and we talk about injustice, if we measure a person by some sort of skill set or some sort of measure we're putting on them at the very beginning, what makes a person important isn't about them being homeless. What makes them important is the fact that they're a person and they're a person valued by God. And so when we're thinking about Homelessness Week, it's entirely appropriate that we talk about the homeless and it's entirely appropriate that we talk about Homelessness Week. But I want to challenge you this morning in your thinking that we don't have homeless people. We have people that are experiencing homeless homelessness or people that are at risk of homelessness because the minute we start viewing people through any different lens we contribute to part of that process that demeans people in where we go so that's my little rant for the very beginning but I'd like you to at least think about that that piece at the very beginning today that it's not just about homelessness that makes that individual God loves them and I guess one of the challenges that we think about and we think about John 3:16 fairly often and in that John 3:16 context we often think about for God so loved and we think about it in a past context. But the reality for John 3.16 is it's about a now context. God still loves. God loves us all. He loves everybody and he loves us wherever we are. So those people that we might not necessarily understand why their circumstances are as, as they are, God loves them. He loves them abundantly. And as you've heard me say numerous times, there's nothing that we can do that's going to make God love us anymore. But there's also nothing that we can do that's going to make God love us any less. And so it's the same with those people that are experiencing homelessness. It's really important that we remember, above all, that they're a person, they're a person valued by God. And coming into Homelessness Week, it's important that we remember that every one of those people matter to God and they should matter to us. There's a few statistics that have come out from National Headquarters that I just want to share with you. Uh, and statistics can be a bit, bit average, but I, I guess probably in the local context, one thing that I'd want to highlight to you that's really important right now is that as we speak... From the beginning of this year, there's been at least 56 people that have died on the streets of Perth. Okay? From the beginning of this year, at least 56 people. And I say at least because there's a whole lot of people that get hospitalised for different reasons that may die afterwards as a result of the circumstances there. But from people living on the street, 56 people in the city of Perth have died this year already. And the most recent one, only in the last week or so, that you know, hit the media a little bit. But that's 56 people. And those 56 people matter to families and all sorts of other connections that are list listed to those as well. So there's hundreds of people impacted by what's happening in that homelessness space. In 2019-20, the Salvation Army's Homelessness Services assisted more than 41,000 people and provided more than 214 sessions of care to people who were, who were at risk or experiencing homelessness. 
between April 2020 and March 2021, the Salvation Army's homeless services provided more than 25,000 extra sessions of care compared to the same period the previous year. These statistics are talking about our homelessness services, so it's actually really important also to understand that our context of homelessness is broader than just our homelessness services. There's homeless people that come to our core settings, there's homeless people that come to our doorway settings, there's, and doorways particularly do a lot of, a lot of work in the space of people at risk of homelessness. Um, so particularly with the ending of the moratorium and the rental rates being as they are now, the doorway space is really important in that homelessness response. So these are purely from homeless services responses. 116 people, 1,000 people were classified as homeless on census night. Now, census is already so old and we're all aware there's a census coming up in August and that figure, I am sure, will be well and truly surpassed because one of the things that's happened is the government's also realised that by the nature of homelessness, there's a whole range of people that haven't even been included in census historically. So they're not even include, included in the numbers because, again, they're not considered people, largely, because they're not picked up in that. And there's been a lot of work in this last six or 12 months to try and pick up on including those people in the census because the importance of the census really is that that's part of the government instrument that's used for uh, allocating resources and things like that. So it's important to understand what the scope of the picture is going forward. There's two, two scripture readings that have been given to us for, for today as well. And the first one is, if anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land of the Lord, your God is giving you do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them, rather be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. In the last few weeks there's been an inclusion policy that's gone out and one of the things it's talked about is compassion and being aware of people around it. Doesn't mean we have to be hooking out all sorts of things when people are there, but we need to be compassionate. How can we help in this situation? And even if it's not my cup of tea, what can I do or what else is around that I might be able to pick up, pick up with? And in verse 10, give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart, then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. The concept of poverty and poorness isn't just about not having a home. It comes into spirituality, it comes into our wealth, it comes into our relationships, it comes into that poverty in a whole range of areas. And that's a challenge for us to think about as well. And then we have in James. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about these physical needs, what good is it? We can't be wandering around and have no idea what's going around about us and really be doing the work of God and being his hands and feet if we're oblivious to the reality of the things that are happening around us. There is a prayer that I'd like you to share in with me now that's been uh, put on this website that I'd just like to share with you now. So a prayer for homelessness. Lord, hear our prayers today for all people who are struggling because they are experiencing homelessness. For those sleeping under bridges, in abandoned buildings, in doorways or in cars for those who can only find shelter for the night but must wander in the daytime, for families broken because they could not afford to pay the rent, for those who are overstaying their welcome among friends, for those who have no relatives or friends who can take them in, for those waiting for permanent housing, for those who have no place to keep positions that remind them of who they are, for those who are cold, afraid and hopeless, for all these people, we pray that you will provide shelter, security and hope. We pray for those of us with warm houses, comfortable beds, food to eat, clothes to wear, with the resources to be more than satisfying our needs, that we may not be lulled into complacency and forgetfulness. Jesus, help us to see your face in the eyes of every person who is experiencing homelessness, so that we may be empowered through the word and deed and through the political means we have to bring justice and peace to those who are homeless. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's easy to sit in the comfort of a church or any other place for that matter and think, well, really, it's a big problem out there, but it's not my problem, it's the government's problem or it's somebody else's problem. And dare I say, the endemic that we work with at the moment is because there's large organisations and individuals that always point to the other person and it's their problem to fix this. 
But the reality is that this is only going to be fixed by all of us working together. And so, um, Deborah has given me a couple of uh, excerpts. It's come from the national thing, but also from a local thing. What is it that we can do in terms of how we can respond to homelessness in our community? We can pray. We can pray about what's happening. We can volunteer at the community lunch. It happens here each Friday. Great opportunity to build relationship. One of the things that's really important going, going forward with people, it's not only about programs that help people address crisis. One of the critical things that's important for people is developing community. And developing community, a place I can belong and a place where I can be going forward is critical for people in their recovery and how they rebuild their life within community. Volunteering through doorways, I've already talked about doorways as a place where a lot of people that are at risk of homelessness particularly, but in Perth particularly, there's people that are experiencing homelessness that come to doorways very openly as well. Um, be an advocate through, for the homeless through your local or state political events that are happening and certainly do that with a passion, but sort of do that with a bit of advice too. So if you're, you're thinking there's something that's happening, please reach out a little bit and make sure we're all on the same page there. It's a very fluid space in homelessness and I'm involved in probably a few meetings a week with various levels of government and stuff like that. It's obviously really important that we're passionate, we push those things forward, but we're also not tipping the bucket on other conversations that are happening in the background and making things worse in the long run. Educate yourself about issues around homelessness. If there's nothing else from today, please remember, people experience homelessness. We don't have homeless people. And the last point that was made here, purchase a copy of The Big Issue. So The Big Issue, if you are or aren't aware of it, The Big Issue is an enterprise that's been developed, creating magazines that get uh, passed around in the community, and they're sold by people that are experiencing hardship, injustice, disadvantage in our community. Not all necessarily homelessness, but certainly a lot of them are. And so that's an opportunity that they can gain an income from what they do, and it helps support them in their community as well. Bless you all. Pray for the homeless and uh, let's make sure that we're on top of what's happening. I'm going to um, invite you to learn a new song this morning and the opening line says, let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one. And I have here a blanket that comes from a group of women and men, but maybe just women, who are filled with kindness and compassion. It's the Lawley Park Village. And uh, they regularly bring in beautiful blanket, blankets that they have made. And we hand them straight away to doorways and they get distributed. Um, I'm so grateful for Ken, uh, Director of Homelessness in our WA, in our state. Uh, I look around the room and I see Deirdre and Ian, and I see Brian, and uh, so many others who are just involved, and people who come to community lunch. And I want, as we've gathered this morning and we've worshipped, we adore you, Heavenly Father, and we've had our eyes open to uh, the state of our community. I guess our response to God this morning, who we have sung and praised, is... God, let us be filled with kindness and compassion for the one. Just the one. You don't have to do it for everybody, but just the one. The one for whom you loved and gave your son. I'm just going to sing the first verse and chorus, and then we're going to sing the whole song together. And it goes like this. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one the one for whom you loved and gave your son for humanity increase my love help me to love with open arms like you do a love that erases all the lines and sees the truth. Oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you. Even in just a smile, they would feel the Father's love. It's not hard, so I invite you to stand together 
and we're going to sing it from the top. And would you make it your prayer this morning? And if you're finding it a little hard to sing, just listen to the group. But let's make this our prayer of commitment today. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one. The one for whom you loved and gave your son for humanity. Increase my love. Help me to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all the lines and sees the truth. When they look in my eyes, they would see you, even in just a smile, they would feel the Father's love. Oh, how you love us, hallelujah, from the homeless to the famous and in between. Such a good father, we sing that again. So let all my life tell of who you are and the wonder of your never ending love. Oh, let all my life tell of who you are. You're wonderful, that you're wonderful and such a good father. You're wonderful and such a good father. Help me to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all the lines and sees the truth. Oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you. Even in just smile, they would feel the Father's love. Dear God, I just uh, feel led to pray just now. and um, We pray that prayer this morning that as we've come into your place and we worship you, as we sing, we adore you, Heavenly Father. We pray that you would help us to love as you love, that you would help us to show compassion as you do. For there is no one like you, God. There is no one like you. We give you all the praise and worship this morning. May our lives reflect the love of the God we worship and adore today. We pray for those experiencing homelessness today. We pray that they would find shelter this evening, a warm blanket and food in their tummies. We pray this in your name. Amen. For a job, I'm a software engineer, which I know sounds fancy, but all it really means is that I know how to use Google better than most people. Um, and this week, I work at home, so I've got nobody looking over my shoulder. And this week, while I was working, I was compiling some code. So my machine was using, was building this code, which gave me a few minutes. Um, 
and I was surfing the internet um, on my other computer. And um, I was looking at these quotes, and you know how sometimes you see these quotes, and you read one and you think, hang on, let me read that again. Um, and I'm going to read the quote because I can't remember. Um, so the quote was this, it was, it isn't what you have or who you are or where you are or what you're doing that makes you happy or unhappy. It is what you think about. Now, what Ken said, he said, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that like reminds me of Sunday school, like where like one of the first songs you're ever taught is Jesus loves you. Um, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I was thinking about that and thinking about this quote and thinking that, well, if the love of God does not make you happy, then you don't really have the love of God. So I just want to sing this song because Jesus loves us. He loves you. He loves me. No matter what we do, there's nothing, as Ken said, we can do to make him love us any less. And I just want to say thank you to God for loving me because that love is real. That love is true. So please join with me as we sing this wonderful song. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock, and now and feet in this world, to be salt and light, and to look out for those less fortunate than ourselves. Lord, let us love today. Amen. Good morning, a very, very warm welcome to everyone in the room again and to everyone at home. Lots of love to all of you in the room and at home. It's great to be together. Um, the announcements. So as you know, our Perth Fortress um, Young People's Band and Timbrels will be tra um, traveling and doing a concert in Adelaide later this year. So we are having a pre-tour concert on, at 7 p.m. on the 4th of September. 
So it's at Per Fortress Core, 7 p.m., 4th of September. Tickets are $10 per, for adults and $5 for children under 12 years of age. Um, who, do we count, who do we let know? Numbers Juanita. Please let Juanita know. Thank you so much, Juanita. Thank you. Other announcements. Per Fortress Companion Band. Um, Companion Club. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Per Fortress Companion Club. Hazel, um, at 10.30 this Tuesday, um, we'll, the, the special guest will be Barbara Stevenson. She's an entertainer, singer, and guitarist. So everyone's looking forward to that. So this Tuesday at 10.30. Uh, next Sunday, our What We Believe series starts. So I'm excited about this, as are many people. So What We Believe series starts next Sunday and runs for three Sundays. Um, it starts at 12, lunch will be provided, so it goes from 12 to 1 p.m., lunch provided. Now the important thing, everyone, is, and I'll ask Russell to raise his hand, please, after the meeting, um, let him know that you are coming. This is purely for numbers, for catering numbers, it's so important, please. So we have lots of people coming already, but please, straight after the meeting, let Russell know, thanks. Then, there's a Just Men's Conference on the, um, from the 17th to the 18th of September. So, um, time is running out to register for this. So, if you could all please, all the men, register for the Just Men co Men's Conference if you are interested. Also, last announcement, there is a men's fellowship taking place on Saturday the 28th of this month. Um, it'll Definitely be dinner somewhere in Northbridge, so we'll park at the fortress, but I'll let you know. If you can let me know if you're interested, Saturday the 20th, 28th of, the, of August. All the other information is in your newsletter, so please check that. Thank you. All right. So I have a little story for you quickly. So a few years ago, I met a lovely friend of mine, her name is Adele. And even though now we live very far away um, and we're not even close to being in the same stage of life, she always seems to reach out to me at the exact right moment. Every now and then I'll just get a text from her saying that she's thinking of me and she's praying for me. And there's always a bit of an encouragement through a verse. But this simple act that she shows me always brings a smile to my face and it always makes me feel very loved. And it always reminds me of the work of God that happens through the other people in my life. So taking a bit from Adele's inspiration, I'm really excited to let you know about a new prayer card initiative that we're starting here at Perth Fortress. And that's going to start at the beginning of September. So we've got a few weeks till it starts. But basically, it's going to work in a very simple way. On the first Sunday of each month, there will be a time for you to collect a prayer card. And on that prayer card, I'll get, if you're able to show you on the screen, there you go. There'll be a picture and a name of somebody. And what you're committing to is you're gonna pray for that person every day for the month. It doesn't have to be a big, long prayer, just very simple, just uplifting them in prayer every day for that month. And if you feel comfortable, you might want to reach out to them. And just, if I'm praying for Debenel, I might let Debenel know, I'm praying for you this month. Is there anything I could be praying for? And they can be as vague or as specific as they want to be. So, moving forward, we want as many people as possible to get involved in this initiative. So, it's a very simple thing you need to do. Number one, decide who's going to be on your card. If you're married, you might like to do it as a couple. You might like to do it separately if you'd like to get your own cards. You might like to do it as a family if you have little kids. And then you need to have your photo taken. Now, you can provide a photo if you really like to. These people have provided their photos. You might like to have your photo taken. There'll be people here to take your photo for the next few Sundays um, because we want to have all our photos by the 29th, the last Sunday of this month. So we can have a full week to collate the cards and be ready for September. If you're not ready today, if you're not photo ready, it's okay. <laughs> I've just sprung it on you today, so you might not be feeling ready. That's okay. <laughs> Pick your moment. Get your hair done. Get your lippy out. It's all right. You too, Russell. <laughs> so 
So we want as many people as possible to get involved in this because we want to surround our core in prayer and love. And I know that this is a praying core, so I have no fear that this is, it's not going to be a hard thing for everyone to get involved in. And of course, for online, if you want to get involved too, you're more than welcome to take a photo and write down your name and email it into us and we'll include you in our prayer cards. So yeah. So that's our new... Oh yes, thank you Karis for reminding me. All your photos need to be portraits. See how the photos are portrait, they're upright? They need to be like that, okay? Just so Karis can make sure they're nice and pretty. She, Karis has designed our cards for us, so round of applause for Karis. <laughs> Thanks guys. It's such a great initiative and uh, the senior leadership team are fully behind it. And when um, Kirsten showed me the card of me and Al and it said, uh, pray for Deb and Al, I just love that. I just love the fact that on a Sunday you might come and take our, our picture and someone random's praying for us. I just think that's beautiful. So put your lippy on like she says and get ready. I'd better go buy some lippy. I don't even own lippy. Anyway. A lot of talking this morning, sorry about that, but these are important, um, important things we need to speak to today. Uh, if you're watching us online this morning, now's your opportunity to send a little message on our Facebook page uh, thanking the tech team. Would you take some moments to start doing that and our Corps Sergeant Major will come and read those out shortly. I will always champion the physical gathering of God's people in the room, right? There is something powerful and somewhat beyond explanation when we gather like this this morning, even in horrendous weather, well done. <laughs> when we gather together in the room, God's people singing together, praying together, worshipping together. And if it weren't for our tech team, it would almost be impossible. And yet for so many gathering at a place of worship like this is simply not possible. It might be because of their age. It might be because they are unwell, vulnerable in body or in mind. It might be just that physically they're really remote, just impossible to get to worship in a physical way. And of course, most recently, COVID. Still today as we speak, many are unable to gather in a room and once again, were it not for our tech team, you, our online congregation, simply would not exist. You do in real life. <laughs> Just not online. You get what I mean. So today we want to honour our tech team. Now, can you all leave your posts? Can, can you some... Can any no, okay, sound person, don't leave your boat. But those who can, if you could just like freeze the cameras or... Oh, right, you all can apparently. So if you wouldn't mind, come up onto the platform. Please, 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 please. Please, come on, come on, come on. Come on. That includes moderators. Yep, great. When COVID struck in March 2020, what I loved about this core was it wasn't a case of, oh no, what are we going to do? It was a case of, okay, what can we do? And in the early days, we borrowed equipment. We had weekly debriefs that got a bit hot-headed. <laughs> weekly debriefs. Just, that was just me. We only had three people in the room. One of us up here, two there. Rachel would hide in the parents' room. I would hide in my office. And then when somebody else left the room, I'd run out. It was crazy. Now, it's a streamlined team effort. Look at them all. A natural part of our Sunday gathering that most of us don't even think about. And yet it comes still with great effort. There have been moments of great stress. Matthew and I will never forget Good Friday, 2020. 
Praise God, he had tidied his beard that morning as it went global. <laughs> we'll never forget it. But I'll tell you what happened in the room that day. We got on with the job. We gave up on live stream and we recorded it. And we did Good Friday and Easter Sunday in the one take. Hence why I was in Navy uniform the whole time. Because Anyway. Yes, there's been moments of joy when it's just all come together. The team fight like normal families do. And yet they fight with grace and forgiveness. They approach their role with seriousness and they protect me and Al, we, only because they know how much I panic, but they protect us from concerns. There could be no internet two minutes before we we're about to start our service and I wouldn't know. They just get on with the job and pray really hard that it will happen. I'm not going to name them all. and One's still up in the crow's nest up there. Over the, hi. But I do, I do want them to join me on the platform. They're here now. Thank you. Um, and this also includes our moderators. So they're the people looking at your comments and um, sometimes having to remove some that are inappropriate. Um, but most of the time, just making sure you feel welcome and are kept connected to us. Uh, I do want to acknowledge Eric Platts this morning, who is not here, unable to be here, but who has played a crucial role right from the outset when COVID struck in helping us deliver our online meeting. But of course, Sergeant Major, would like to come and uh, have some of our online made, yeah, so let's just hear from the online people this morning. Well, I won't name all the people, but I will give you the messages. I think that's more important. Tech team, you're the best, as we all look amazing each week. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was from a front row songster. Uh, thanks again to the tech guys. We value and appreciate the ministry of them. Thanks, tech team, you're legends. I honor the enormous efforts of the Perth Fortress tech team. Your online ministry will bear more fruit than you will ever be aware. God has gifted and resourced you for such a time as this. Thank you. Bless you, Perth Fortress. Thanks for your ministry. Thank you, tech team. Feeling really blessed to be able to worship and feel that connection with everybody today through video. We value and appreciate the ministry of the tech team. A big thanks from me. It helps me to stay in touch with the Lord and the Fortress Fellowship. Well done, tech team. Thank you for connecting us to worship for the past year and a half. We have been blessed to be virtual soldiers from Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you, Perth Fortress tech team, for giving us the opportunity to participate in worship each week. We're very thankful for you each and appreciate your service. And that's from Sydney Congress Hall. Thanks, tech team, for all you do. A very special thank you to the super team who help reach out to others around the world. Your hard work is so special. Feel blessed to share with you in ministry. Well done to, all, to you all for all you do. Enjoying your worship service as we in New South Wales enjoy the lockdown. So glad to worship with the officers. So glad to be able to worship with you all. Now I know the tech guys, somebody is saying. Excellent tech team. Thank you, guys. And the, the comments are still coming. Thank you. So on behalf of all of us, I'm a little bit emotional just looking at them. You are brilliant and we really appreciate you. Thank you for allowing us to see and hear in the room every week and thank you for making our online congregation feel every much a part of the room. We're going to acknowledge them a little bit later. They're all going to come back and have um, lunch at our place, well, most of them. Um, I cook, that could be bad. <laughs> But uh, we just want to show them our thanks. Uh, but would you please put your hands as they take their, resume their positions. Come on, back to your positions. Yes, thank you. And now it's time for Kids Spot so the kids can get out to their ministries as well. Thank you, Joe. Come a little bit closer because then you need to you need to kind of see what we're doing. And um, 
my two girls that I lined up this morning as well. So when you eventually get to it this morning, your scripture reading is from Ephesians 4, something, 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 and it's not here for me to remind you, but that's what it is. And in a nutshell, in the big church today, they're talking about unity, being united, which is as one, which is the same, but different. So I've brought a few things to kind of illustrate that. Paul, can you knock the lights off for me, please? We're just going to be in the dark for a very short while. Can you guys on the floor see these? Can you see these? I need you to give me a one-word answer. Are they the same or different? Are they the same? Are they the same or different? Hmm. Is this same or different? Hmm, okay. Hang on, I've got one more, but it's so dark I can't find it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Same or different? There's really no right or wrong answer. Same or different? Okay, we can have the lights back up now, please. Thanks, tech team. Thanks, light technician in the hallway. Oh, here's a tricky one. Same or different? Same or different? One word answer. Same or different? And just because it's me, same or different? It's a lucky this survivor night in my house last night. Same or different same or different okay there we go hold that thought hold the thought of same but different so if in your houses you've been watching the olympics this week you'll have got that idea it's the same but different very clearly in the olympics no two competitors in any of the events look the same they don't train the same they don't wear the same Hang on, have I got this the right way around now? Have I? Am I on the right track? They're different, but they're all going for the same. That's right, isn't it? Glad I've got my external conscience here. They're all going for the same medal. They all want to win. They're doing their best to win that gold medal. That one aim unites them, making them the same in their desires and their efforts. So back to my examples, my flashy lights, kind of the same but different. They look the same, they feel the same, but they've got different lights in them, different colours, different things. So they might have an outward expression of being the same, but they're actually different. And ultimately, this could be us. This could be us being Jesus in the world, bringing light to the world. The chocolate. Well, it's the same whether it's big or small. If this was your body, the chocolate is just a bit of fun, really, isn't it? It's something happy and it's something nice that we can bring into the world. It sweetens it and it makes it nice. The fruit, it's actually different, but it is the same. The fruit builds us and makes us strong. It's like the fruits of the spirit. And again, it's just another example of showing that we can be Jesus in the world. The same but different is unity. Being different, but the same is unity. Pushing for the same goal. Being one body and one spirit as you were all called into the same glorious hope of divine destiny. For his body, his church, has been formed in his image and is closely joined together and constantly connected as one. And every member Every member has been given divine gifts to contribute to the growth of all. And as these gifts operate effectively throughout the whole body, we are built up and made perfect in love. Let's have a week where we're all the same but different, shining our light, having fun, and being the fruits of the Spirit. And um, we're going to have the offering now, so you guys are free to go out the back.
morning. So I'll be doing the scripture reading, which is Ephesians 4, uh, 1 to 16. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble, gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ opportuned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascend mean? Except that he also deascended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all, the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for workers of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. While we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does at work.
Well, good morning to you. Good morning to you. It's been a great time of worship. We've had quite a bit going on in our service this morning and uh, a lot of talking heads, isn't there? Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm another one. <laughs> We've been on the journey to, uh, through the New Testament letter to the Ephesian church and today we're in uh, chapter 4, uh, this letter that was just read a little while ago um, with Tia's help. Uh, the author of the letter, likely to, the, uh, to be the Apostle Paul, is outlining the encouragement to these uh, Christians in this church. And what's notable was that this group of Christians was made up of uh, Jews and Gentiles. And um, we talked about that uh, a few weeks ago. And they were really coming from a very opposing background and positions. But now they're united at this one people of God. And the principal mark of the church is unity. And that's what we've been talking about this morning in this scripture passage. And the calling of Christians is to build up the body of Christ in all that they do. And this call to unity is uh, the foundation for maturity. Uh, this passage is a message for us, unity and maturity. And I just want to emphasise that because that's what hopefully you'll, you'll take away from this morning. And the appeal of this passage, therefore, is, is to encourage us to accept the calling to unity willingly, to step into that space with confidence. As uh, from our passage from chapter 4, and if you want to have it in front of you, I'll, I'll be making lots of references to the scripture this morning from Ephesians chapter 4. It says, We are urged to lead a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called, and it goes on to say, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. So this worthiness is when that calling aligns with our character. Now we get that, don't we? Um, it's the same as when our actions don't match our words. We are, some, we are someone who others will not be willing to tr uh, trust or believe in. And this is clearly obvious for us as the church. That how can we expect anyone to see anything attractive or hopeful about Christ in us if our character contradicts the gospel? And it all starts at home, as they say. And I mean in the fellowship of believers, the church. And in verse 2, here in verse 2 of Ephesians 4, we have four graces that uh, Paul outlines, evidence that is essential proportion uh, between calling and character. He's talked about humility and gentleness and patience and forbearance. He features these four. And I just want to just briefly spend a few moments just looking at these. Humility. It's quite interesting to find that the original word for, um, the Greek word for um, humility was actually a, a very derogatory term suggesting low-mindedness and a groveling civility. And before Christianity, this word was not counted as a virtue. The ancient world looked on humility as something to be despised. It denoted cringing and cowering. And, but the word was redeemed by the gospel to represent uh, a de distinctly Christian virtue. Christian humility comes from self-knowledge. To truly face oneself is the most humiliating thing in the world. It comes when we see our weaknesses, when we see our selfishness, when we see our failures. And humility comes when setting life in light of the demands of God himself and measured alongside a life, the life of Christ. Because when we do that, we will soon see and recognise how short we fall, how small we are, how feeble we are. It's a place where there's no room for pride. Humility keeps us grounded in the reality that we are in absolute dependence on God. We are creatures in the presence of the Creator. It's a great equaliser, isn't it? If we're tempted to measure ourselves against the standard of the world or another person or our neighbour, we may feel some sense of superiority. After all, we're better than them. But it's such a trap. For no matter how much we might claim, all of us, no matter who we are or where we're from or what we've done, have fallen short of the glory of God and in need of God. And this is the reminder to treat each other accordingly. Humility is the evidence of dependence on God. Linked with humility is gentleness, he says. Don't be fooled by this word too. It's not a feeble word or a weak word. In fact, it's actually about strength. It's the opposite. The meaning of the word includes having an inner strength, uh, which is God-controlled, to find the balance between ex being excessively angry or never being angry at all. And there's a balance in between that is strength. To mean being angry all the, at the right time 
and being not angry at the wrong time. <laughs> and it's the element of restraint that is that controlled strength. And this is what gentleness is. Humility and gentleness. And then there's patience. One that nobody really wants. <laughs> patience can be a virtue we all want to have, but not really willing to have. I mean, we might pray, God, give me patience, but give it to me now, don't we? <laughs> but patience isn't easy. And it can mean a difficult steadfastness in the endurance of suffering. But even more so, and how it is often used in the, in the New Testament, it, is, it describes a reluctance to avenge wrongs. Something that finds its expression in forbearance, that last one. This is to bear with another person by accepting them with his or her faults and idiosyncrasies, knowing that we have our own. To persist to love in the face of insult and injury. To forbear without bitterness and without complaint. To have the power and the means to retaliate or take revenge, but refusing to do so. This patience and forbearance are the very characteristics of God himself. When you, when you be honest about it, his, his creature called mankind has consistently let him down, rejected him, defied him, hurt him. Yet God, who has every means to retaliate, has shown patience and forbearance towards mankind. Such is his love for them. We, you and I, are testimony to the grace of God. We let God down, we hurt him, Yet his mercies are new every morning. He doesn't give up on us. He's patient and forbearing. And if God is such with us, we dare insult him when we cannot be like that to one another. Humility, gentleness, patience and forbearance. And these, as this in said, in chapter 4 where Paul tells us these virtues are in order to keep the unity. He tells uh, the Ephesians in verse 3 to make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And what's important to notice here is the emphasis on making every effort to do this. It's not enough just to tolerate. It's not enough just to ignore. It's not enough to avoid addressing issues. The preservation of this unity of the spirit, uh, unity requires every effort on the part of God's people to create spaces of grace where diversity in life and practice is honoured. Thanks, Joe, for helping us think of that. We don't have to agree or be the same, but we can respect and celebrate our differences so that we are healthier and stronger together. And finding ways to do this that safely allow us to understand and grow together. Diversity... Um, is not just a slogan or a catchphrase you can lump on your ch church poster. It's making every effort to, in recognition and acceptance and practice and celebration of the gifts that God has given to the community of people so that the body of Christ may be built up, as it says in verse 12. This unity is the oneness that Paul is so often writing about, not just here in this chapter, but in many of his letters. The word one is actually quite, seems to be quite a favourite word of Paul. Actually, in our reading, did you notice how many times he used the word one? Seven times he talks about, uh, in, when, you know, like he's, he's ranting away and he keeps saying one, 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 one. One spirit, uh, one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope uh, when you were called. This is verse five and six. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. He doesn't have to take a breath. He just kept going, didn't he? One body, he talked about. That's obviously, he's re referring to the, the church as a single entity, sing single community. One spirit, that's the, the, um, in, the one, uh, sorry, one spirit indwells the one body of Christ. The Holy Spirit is, is the soul of the, of the one body. Uh, apart from the, uh, from the Holy Spirit, the church cannot exist. And every Christian, yes, every Christian, no matter how diverse or different, is united with all other Christians by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within. And the Holy Spirit is the guarantor of the one hope that he talks about, to which every Christian is called. Our methods, our organisation, even our religious views may be different at times, but we are all striving, and thanks Joe for reminding us, towards the one hope, the whole world redeemed in Christ. And Christ is the one Lord in which we put one faith. 
that all Christians are bound together because they have made a common act of surrender to the love of Jesus Christ. They may describe and live out their act of surrender in different ways, on different terms, but that surrender is the one thing that they all have in common. This is clearly an example in the term that he also mentions, the one baptism. In the church as a whole, baptism is regarded as a sacrament of unity. It's the symbolising, the identification with Christ in his death and resurrection and sealing with the Spirit and incorporation into the body of Christ so that all Christians become one person in Christ. Now, we in the Salvation Army, we we don't practise the sacrament of baptism in our worship. And while we don't do that, uh, we certainly identify definitely with Christ in his death and resurrection as a transformational unity as believers in the body of Christ. We are still united in this baptism. And Paul wraps up all these run of ones uh, in verse 6. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. One God in the sense that we believe there is one God, uh, not many. And he is the Father of all in the sense that he is the creator God who reigns and over all and works through all. It's a statement of faith, isn't it? And we'll be looking more at that in coming days. This is is a great reminder that no matter what things may look like, God is in control as well. And all this oneness uh, that Paul um, says is is nice, isn't it? Don't you think? It's the ideal. um, And the image of a wonderful life, a wonderful church and a wonderful God. But I also want to be realistic. It's not easy to see it all the time. And I don't for a moment think Paul was naive. He was extremely honest and pragmatic about how much of a challenge it is to live out this unity. And that's the case as he emphasises that unity requires the people to grow up, to come to reach maturity, make every effort. And he further emphasised this maturity is to be embracing each other's different gifts from Christ and serving the body of Christ with those ministries. To know what God wants us each to do. What's our part to play? What has God got set aside for us individually? What part is my part? What part is your part? And then to do that in harmony with one another. He said in verse 7, To each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And in verse 12, So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Within the body of Christ, each member shares, uh, enjoys a share of God's grace, the aim of which was that the church would be fully equipped and built up to arrive at perfect unity and to reach a perfect maturity. The ultimate end in view is the attainment of the completeness in Christ. Unity in the faith is a goal to be reached, while which we will arise from an increasing knowledge of Christ in our life, as the Son of God and as the corporate as well as an in-person experience. In this way we grow up and reach maturity. In verse 15 and 16, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Each part does its work. It is unity in Christ to reach maturity in Christ. The question I ask is, do we want this? I don't want to prescribe what that means for you. But I do want to ask you to invite the Holy Spirit to help you. And to help us to know what that means for us as a people of God. Personally and together, corporately. And take the encouragement uh, from the words to the Ephesians. Let, Let us... Lead a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called by making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I don't want to linger here with this thought, but I want to, I've chosen us for us to sing a prayer together. And it's a prayer asking us for God's help to be his people, to be his people of unity, to help us to live in the the unity in Christ and asking God to help us grow 
in maturity, to realise that maturity in Christ. Help us to help each other, Lord, each other's cross to bear. Let each his friendly aid afford and feel his brother's care. Help us to build each other up, our little stock improve, increase our faith, confirm our hope, and perfect us in love. And up unto thee, our living head, let us in all things grow, till thou hast made us free indeed and spotless here below. Some great words, uh, that is our prayer, and I invite you to stand if you are able and want to, to let this be a united prayer, as it's help us as we sing. Let us sing this as our prayer together this morning. us to be continue in prayer dear god and father of all we we need you forgive us when we think we don't we are your creature and you are our creator and we fail you and we let you down with our sin and our selfishness and our pride yet you show us grace and you never give up on us your mercies are new every day you sent your son so that we might have freedom from ourselves with your Spirit's help within us, help us live lives worthy of your calling, to make every effort to keep the unity in Christ in your church and to grow more and more like Christ, Amen. to reach the maturity of Christ. This is our prayer and we need your mercy. We ask this for ourselves personally and corporately, that your Holy Spirit will help us each day. We ask this in the name of the Christ, through the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'm actually going to ask you to stand up again. I'm sorry. Because <laughs> it's really hard to sing, for I'm building a people of power while you're sitting. Because it's hard to build while you sit. So won't you please stand? <laughs>
live lives worthy of the one calling which we all share. In humility, gentleness and patience, speak only what is true and loving and so grow into the unity that is ours in Christ. And may God the creator shape, reshape your hearts. May Christ Jesus, the bread of life, sustain you always and may the Holy Spirit unite you in the bond of peace. We go in, we go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you each.